So it's a crazy and tumultuous feeling to spend your entire professional career in pandemic preparedness, and all of a sudden now, we got coronavirus. So people would come up to me and say, Matt, what do you do for a living? And I'd say, my job is to prepare for the next pandemic. And then I would go on and on about infections and black swan events and all this other stuff. Their eyes would glaze over. I was always that guy at the party that all I could do was talk about work. But now, the pandemic is here. And this is serious. And I know you're worried, and I'm worried too. I'm worried about the little things, like should I get on a plane next month? Should I make that trip or not? I'm worried about the big things. Is my family going to be safe? My son, who's in college, we just got a note from the university saying there's a suspected case on campus. I'm worried about all those people in hospitals, on ventilators, that are suffering right now from this terrible infection. And I'm also worried because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. These things are inherently difficult to predict. So there's so much uncertainty and anxiety. What do we do? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. You can, you can use this if this is helpful for you. I made this decision already. The first thing, professionally, I decided I'm going to prepare for the worst case scenario. I learned that from working with emergency managers and watched how they responded to hurricanes. What they would do is that they would always over-prepare and prepare for the worst. And what they said, Matt, we can always scale back. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to work 16 to 18-hour days. I already have. And I'm going to work that throughout the entire pandemic. And the good news for you, there are millions of people worldwide, professionals right now, that are doing the exact same thing. We're in this together, and we're all working towards that. The second thing that I've decided is that I'm not going to give up. Don't give up. We cannot be paralyzed by fear. We cannot be say, hey, look, the pandemic's inevitable. There's nothing that we can do. No. And where do I draw a little bit of hope from that? I draw some hope from the years, the decades, that many of us have been working on, the effort, the research investments to prepare for the next pandemic. I think we're ready. I think we're going to get through this. And I'm going to give you a lot of examples. But furthermore, and I will be even more bold, I believe we are moving to a future where we could actually take pandemics off the table. What I mean by that is truly eliminate the threat of pandemic disease. Now, to some people, that sounds silly and outrageous, especially with the current situation. Well, let's see if I can convince you. But I'm convinced that we can mount the most effective pandemic defense that the world has ever seen. Now, successful defense against a pandemic, this is a very complex problem, as everybody knows. There's public health, there's medicine, there's quarantine, there's social distancing. Read the CDC website, yes, wash your hands, follow all those things. Do those things. But there are three strategic building blocks that I think will make a huge difference. Those are advanced technology, global cooperation, and political will. Let's take them one at a time, and we can start with technology. Now, I know I get it. It's not technology is the panacea that will solve all of our problems. It's not what I'm saying. But in this case, I think technology is a critical part of the recipe for success. See, because by definition, this is a novel situation, and we have a new virus. So therefore, research and development is required right now in real time. And it's happening because this will allow us to accelerate our ability to find vaccines and treatments. So here's where the good news starts. This process used to, to find a new vaccine, used to take sometimes up to 10 to 15 years, hundreds of millions of dollars, a really long period of time. I think now with technology that we can go from discovery to at least having products in clinical trials in weeks, maybe months, but I like to say weeks, at a fraction of the cost. Now, for a number of years, I worked at a place called DARPA. I'm no longer there now, um, but I still collaborate with them. DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And there, my DARPA colleagues and I came up with a program that we called the Pandemic Prevention Platform, or P3 for short. 
The goal of P3 was to have 20,000 doses of a protective compound within 60 days. Now, you might say, well, a pandemic, we're talking about 100 million infections, 20,000, does that really make a difference? But our premise is that you make this, you administer it early, and you interrupt transmission in those communities. If you can interrupt it, then potentially you can head off the pandemic, or at least you can slow things down. Think about a fire break, halting, or a series of fire breaks, to halt the spread of a fire. So 20,000 doses in 60 days, a highly ambitious goal. And we knew that. We knew we were going to push the envelope a little bit. That's, that's kind of how DARPA is, and that's kind of how I was. And so we met with a set of government experts, this is a few years ago, and we said this, and what did they do? They left. That's okay. Um, they didn't think it was possible, but it is. And I think we would all agree, it's desperately needed now. Now, I'm not saying that a coronavirus vaccine is going to be available and ready for the world in a month. Unfortunately, it's going to take a little bit longer. And the P3 technology that I'm going to describe to you, I mean, this is still early research. We still have a lot of work to do. But I'm profoundly excited to see how fast we can go. And I'm telling you right now, our teams are going to be going 24-7, and we are going to be matching that type of effort until we get to that finish line. Now, P3 is based on several breakthrough technologies. The first step is you got to have a little bit of virus, and you use that virus to start an automated, super-fast antibody discovery effort. Once you identify those antibodies, then you can do different technologies to advance them to maturity, to make them highly potent. Finally, P3 uses certain technologies uh, using nucleic acid constructs, and you can administer these nucleic acid constructs, these pieces of genes, into the patient. The, these are the instructions for your cells to make that highly protective antibody. And the good news is that those genetic sequence constructs, you can make thousands of those in a very short period of time. So if you can do all of those steps, and you put it together, and you integrate it, and take it start to finish, maybe we can get there. 20,000 doses in 60 days. Basically, we're talking about engineering antibodies that are so effective that you get near immediate protection once they're administered, and they can last for the duration of the outbreak. And we're getting better at this all the time. And it's an ensemble of technologies, including microfabrication and automation, machine learning, genetic sequencing. It's a combination of those discrete advances that add up to a very powerful medical emergency response capability. So you say, show me the evidence. Let me give you an example from Zika virus. If we say Zika infection, you might say, OK, again, to get a protective compound, you're probably going to need months or even years to go through that discovery process and show that it works in animal models. But in this P3 program, scientists at Vanderbilt University were able to do all of that in just 78 days. Now, pandemics have a number of su additional success stories where we've seen advanced technology making a difference. Another example is this genetic sequence concept. We can also use that as a vaccine. And in this sense, your cells make an antigen to induce a highly protective long-term response. This can be either DNA or this can be RNA. And there's opportunity there. We can speed design. We can manufacture these things at scale. And I think we can make vaccines now for this pandemic faster than we ever have before. We're also seeing a lot more good news. Breakthroughs in medical diagnostics, high-throughput screenings, PCR, we're doing that better than we ever have before. Disease modeling and forecasting, that allows us to know how bad do you think this outbreak is going to be and where is it going to go next. We're seeing a lot of progress in portable medical technology so that healthcare workers can provide care in the home or in resource-limited settings. And so that's why I say technology is that first building block for pandemic defense, we're racking up tremendous progress. Now, what about that second building block, which is global cooperation? Now, I think everybody would agree that if we really want to take pandemics off the table, no one country can do that alone. We have to do this together. Now, peoples throughout the world are recognizing very clearly right now because of coronavirus that these diseases clearly recognize no boundaries. But as a result, I'm happy to say I think we're building a stronger and stronger model for international cooperation. 
Now, one of the next frontiers where I'm seeing great progress is in wider, even global, clinical trials. After all, it just makes sense that we should be testing a new drug or vaccine in the areas where that new threat is emerging. And I think the international cooperation on doing these clinical trials, evaluating products for coronavirus in near real time to see if they are safe and effective, this is happening better than it ever has before. And I do believe this is going to continue to grow as long as we are mindful of all of the associated cultural and ethical implications of everything that we're doing. So the third building block, this is political will. Now, many countries in the world obviously have not prioritized pandemic preparedness as their number one thing. And we understand that. You think about all the competing priorities, even of all the things that we heard about on stage today. But now everybody's paying attention. This idea we have a unique opportunity with, the world, with worldwide political will to fight this pandemic. It's not too late. And I've seen over the last few years that the examples of political will in these outbreak responses is getting better and better. We can look at Ebola outbreaks in Africa where we've seen a fast and robust response. And we've seen true heroism in these African nations and in their healthcare workers that have mitigated these outbreaks. Another positive sign is social media is encouraging governments to be more transparent and it's really forcing people to reconcile with the facts on the ground. Additionally, I think we're fortunate to have a lot of leadership in global health. We have the World Health Organization, we have UNICEF, we have the Gates Foundation, we have the Coalition of Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation. We have PEPFAR, these are outstanding global health programs. Well, guess what? Those are the programs that provide the foundation for us to have a more effective pandemic response. We're fortunate, too, that there's a good connection between progress in technology and political will. You see, as the timelines for R&D investments leading to these great payoffs, as that time, those timelines truncate, it encourages more investment in the basic science. And then we generate more political will, the R&D timelines continue to decrease, and then we get more political will as a result. You see, it's a virtuous, self-reinforcing, and it's a very positive circle. And this is happening right now, and I'm watching that in real time. So how does it all add up? I mean, there is no question this situation is really serious. And I hope I'm getting this message across to you that we need to double down on our efforts on all things pandemic response. There's a lot that everybody in this room can do. But in those three building blocks, we have advanced technology, we have global cooperation, and we have political will and a lot of opportunities. And this convinces me that we can mount a national an international response that can make a tremendous difference immediately, but it can also eliminate pandemics in the future. I think this is a stretch goal. Okay, I got that. But that finish line, in my opinion, is in sight. And if we can get that message across to the public and as a society, I think it will dramatically enhance our effective response. Believe me, public support is critical to our success. This pandemic situation is far too big and important for a few people behind closed doors to say they're going to take care of all of it themselves. We need everybody involved. We need the media to educate the public on the virus. We need philosophers who are invaluable when it comes to thinking through the ethical implications of the procedures that we're doing. Healthcare systems need to adapt in real time we need to embrace much more distributed healthcare models because we're going to need to take care of patients in their homes. There's a critical role from anthropologists, we just heard about this, to help us achieve cultural understanding and respect. Everybody, everybody has an important role to play. One of my mentors used to say, you know, people want to be part of a winning team. Her point was that people are keenly aware of their time and effort and they want to make sure it's making an impact. And if they feel they're making a significant difference, then they'll line right up behind you. In the face of this current coronavirus pandemic, this big and daunting pro problem, now is not the time to play on people's fears. Now is not the time to say there's nothing that can be done and to just give up. 
This is the time to appeal to the public sense of optimism and to resilience. I feel we can do that with facts and we can do that with empowerment. And instead of being divided, why don't we as a global community unite and fight this pandemic together as a team? And for me and for a lot of us, the goal is not just to defeat today's pandemic. The ultimate goal is to take pandemics off the table entirely. And I believe we can then face the current situation and the future threat with confidence. By the way, when we look at those three building blocks of technology and global cooperation and political will, there's another enormous benefit. And I'm not the first one to come up with this. I'm sure this has been said on the TED Med stage many times before. But health and medicine are a cause that every person and every, every country can get around and rally. We've seen this time and again with global health. It becomes this common ground for understanding and cooperation and goodwill. And so I'm convinced that nations can unite against this common foe of disease and in this current situation of pandemics. And this then becomes a blueprint for us to work together on the greatest global challenges of the 21st century. I think that's a success story that we can all support. I think that's a winning team that we all can join. Thank you.